Nina Fury <laughs> of the Astoria Film Festival. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out and uh, having a discussion with us today about your organization, about the arts community, about Long Island City. So uh, why don't we just get started by you sort of giving us a little sketch um, about uh, the Astoria Film Festival. Great, thank you for having me. I appreciate being included. Um, started the Astoria Film Festival back in 2018. Um, I have a background in film and television production and I have also a background in education. So I had been working at the Variety Boys and Girls Club at the time and uh, I noticed that there was a demand for filmmaking classes. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, we need more instructors. How do we find them in the community? And I thought, oh, well, if we throw a film festival, we'll find the filmmakers who are in the community. And then I could possibly convince them to work with the children who want to learn filmmaking. And um, the there there was trouble with management there so i kind of went out and ended it on my own and that's when the festival began um and we had our first festival and lo and behold not only did i recruit people who wanted to work with the children in the neighborhood but i also realized that the filmmakers in the neighborhood really wanted support and community as well and then things just kind of grew organically from there so now we have the festival the main festival we do shorts, web series, podcasts, feature films. Then we also have the uh, youth festival that highlights work from ch children 18 and younger. And we have a, a horror festival on Halloween um, because a lot of, well, initially a lot of the youth films they, they just, that we did in workshops, they wanted to do horror films. So we kind of, and then we just got a lot of interest from people who did horror. So we've kind of expanded as people have requested things. Uh, and then recently we started a film fellows program where we mentor 15 to 25 year old film students or just students who want to, to be in media and film and um, you know have them do projects with us. Some of them are being paid through their schools or through SYP. And uh, we you know find the mentorships at different companies, MTV and T, uh, food, T, food, T, food Network have been two of the ones that have come forward. They're people I've worked with in the past. And, um, you know, just making sure that they have the, the skills and the resume to kind of carry them forward. And with always a focus on underserved populations, first gen, women, BIPOC, LGBTQ, disabled, um, filmmakers or want to be filmmakers. Well, if we can put a plug in for you, we have hosted uh, one of your events and I can uh, certainly testify that uh, this is first rate. Um, Thank you. you had uh, uh, different uh, 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 entries. Uh, and one of the, actually the favorite was uh, was the one that the young people put together, the youth had put together. And that, that was really fantastic. So you're really doing a great job and really I hope they can continue forward. But that sort of leads into our sort of our question. How has the pandemic affected your operation and what's been your response to it? Sure, I mean, we were really ramping up uh, pre-pandemic. We were, you know, Kaufman uh, Astoria Studios has been very supportive of us and they've given us their space to use for free, the Zucker Theater initially um, and so we were just starting to do a whole, we were gonna do a monthly movie series in the Zucker with Kaufman starting February, 2020, we did our first. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And then we were ramping up to do all these workshops in local schools. We were actually uh, starting in six local schools. So I had just bought, you know, and we were doing some at the same time. So I had hired, you know, a bunch of film students and I had, um, bought multiples of camera equipment because you know we were going to be needing them <laughs> and then that was we started march 1st 2020 with that so you know it really was like a, a brick wall just fell in front of us and we had to pull back really suddenly and re readjust and you know once the shock of the pandemic kind of wore down um and i could figure out what to do i luckily had a background my, my specific background in television and film was how do you make it interactive? So in the mid nineties, I was part of a group at Viacom. It was a R and D group, really trying to figure out how to create interactive television, interactive film experiences. So luckily I had that experience to pull on to say, okay, let's start doing, um, you know, 
a community documentary where everybody we, we, we met weekly, everybody submitted whatever they could and kind of like, how can we document this time for future historians idea. And honestly, I sat on that footage for the past year because it was so emotional to me that every time I went to edit it, I was in tears. So uh, I just started editing it non emotionally this past month. Uh, so it should be live soon. But it was a good way to just kind of get our feet back in the water after the crash of the pandemic. And then we started to do online workshops with the kids that we were supposed to be going to the schools with. And we continued to do like the community meetups with the filmmakers in the community, mostly around the um, that doc work. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely a shock. And I think, you know, to, it helped me getting over the shock of the pandemic and the nervousness I felt personally just by trying to do something creative. And I think helping everyone else get that creative outlet was also seen as, you know, people were very grateful to have that creative outlet. The really unfortunate thing about the pandemic is that for those of us that uh, submit for the grant cycle, it, yes. we, we just have put in what yeah. we're going to be doing the second half of 2020, the first half of 2021, and this thing hits us like two weeks later. So, yeah. you know, the grants pretty much became a moot point, and then, of course, the city had funding problems. But with that in mind, do you, do you believe the support for the arts community has been adequate, um, you know, from the local government and from the, the grant uh, uh, sources? Um, and what are your suggestions in terms of going forward? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've gotten minimal support in grants. Um, we usually basically use all of our like festival proceeds to fund the workshops and, and the meetups because uh, we try to not charge or charge as little as possible for those that we are making sure we actually are serving the underserved who can't afford the high prices of a, a film workshop. Um, I think that, you know, the arts need to be seen as more of like a small business, you know, and, and, and supported in the same way that small businesses are supported. Um, I don't think we get that recognition right now, and especially if we don't have a, a physical structure like Astoria Film Festival, we rent out the classroom space as we need it. We rent out, um, you know, event space as we need it. And so with all of the, you know, any, any kind of help that came through the pandemic financially didn't really come to us. Um, so, you know, at this point, I've just been treading water to make sure we stay afloat to some degree. Um, you raise a very interesting point because a lot of people think that when it comes to the arts, it's somebody's passion or their hobby or, or something of that nature. And yes, I mean, it, it's great that you do something that you really enjoy and you can really, really do it you know, well uh, if, you, if you approach it from that perspective. But also uh, from an economic standpoint, the arts, um, I think, has a very strong impact on the local economy. You take a look at Absolutely. measure all the the, the uh, benefits that the arts community brings to uh, you know people go to your event and they go to a restaurant afterwards or people will, you know there, there, there's the the arts I, I, how would you describe the art scene in Long Island City specifically and what are its future prospects do you believe? I mean I, I was born and raised here so I I've grown up with you know Kaufman taking over the studios and bringing that to life and then all of the ancillary businesses that came up around that. Um, I think that revitalized the entire, you know, situation. I remember what it looked like before they came in. It was, it oh, was I, I went to school down, you know, at my elementary school was literally a block away from the studio. Oh, I know so it is. Yes. Okay. We weren't allowed to cross that street. <laughs> you know, sound, didn't it? With all the windows and everything. I mean, you know, there was broken glass everywhere. Yeah. There were literally, I'm sorry, there, there are prostitutes and drug dealers everywhere. I mean, you're, you know, parents just did not want you there. And I remember, um, you know, my local parish, the parish priest, literally making a campaign of going to, like, save people from the parish. To what's there now. Right. And, and now you have this beautiful, thriving community with businesses and people want to come here. Like the idea of Astoria as a destination for tourists blows my mind even to this day as, as a kid who grew up here. But so I think it's been thriving for years thanks to Kaufman. I think it will continue to thrive thanks to all of these. There's so many of us out here, you know, really trying to do what we love and loving the city. Like I, I started 
this because I love the kids I was working with. And I love, and I, I grew up a first gen kid, right? Immigrant working class parents. I Getting into media and television was not easy uh, mm. with that background. And I wanted to give these kids mentors. I wanted to give these kids skills, make it a little easier for them. So, you know, and I think a lot of people are in, in this area are doing similar work, uh, you know, like from the Chocolate Factory, Queensboro Dance Festival, you know, the parks, uh, Socrates, Noguchi, Astoria, like they're all doing work because they love this place. Love, love, love this place. I, I had someone give us a review yesterday and it was, it was, my, the reviews have always been mind blowing. Like I'm, cause you just do your thing and you hope it's okay. <laughs> and then you get a beautiful review and you're like, okay, life is good, you know? <laughs> and they said, I've never seen a festival so international and yet so local in the same package. And I think that's very much Astoria, right? It is, we are so international and yet such a nice small town. And the arts just thrive here because everybody is welcome here. Everybody's accepted here and the people love this place. People doing the arts here do it here because they love this place. And I think um, I think it has a great future. Well, I just think we could use some more support. <laughs> well, now, for, for anybody who's interested in um, attending any of your programs, which I can highly recommend, um, why don't you give us a little contact where, where, where you are, your websites, Facebooks, what have you. So give yourself a little, a little plug as to how people can uh, reach your, some of your programs. Thank you. We are at uh, website is AstoriaFilmFestival.org. Um, we're on Instagram at Astoria Film Festival. We're on YouTube as Astoria Film Festival. We're also, we, we have a lot of content on YouTube because since the um, festival was all online last year, we did in person as well, but a lot, it, we put everything online. So it's all there and we'll do it again this year just for accessibility purposes, uh, even if we still can do more in person. Um, and then we're also recently on TikTok, which I'm trying to still figure out. <laughs> but, uh, and Facebook as, at um, Astoria NY Film, I believe, was what it was when we started that. Well, well thank you. I, I do appreciate you taking the time out from your busy schedule. And uh, we will be uh, letting you know when uh, this will go online. It'll be for uh, James Walk weekend. So Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bob Singleton, Executive Director of the Greater Story Historical Society, and we have another interview in our series, The Art Scenes of Long Island City. Today, we'll be speaking with Shannon Murphy, the Director of Education. Hi, Bob. Thanks so much for having me. Um, as you mentioned, I've been the Director of Education at the Noguchi Museum now for a little over five years, uh, and I'm very passionate about the arts community in Long Island City. Wonderful. Uh, now, as you know, this is for uh, Jane's Walk weekend. Uh, Jane Jacobs was a person who uh, was engaged in a lot of discussions about what makes an urban environment successful. Um, and one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, a successful community is a thriving art scene. Now, as we all know that uh, every, every dimension of our great city in New York has been affected by the COVID. So uh, I have a couple of questions for you uh, on how uh, your organization specifically and generally how the uh, uh, cultural scene uh, within Long Island City has responded. So my first question is, how has the pandemic affected your operations and what has been your response to these challenges? Sure. Uh, well, we, we had to close the museum a number of times throughout the pandemic, um, and we are reopened right now at a limited capacity. Um, our exhibition schedule changed quite a bit, and our programs have become primarily virtual. Um, but in our team throughout the entire time has just worked tirelessly to create a safe space for continuing to visit the museum. Do you uh, believe that support for the arts community, uh, specifically to your, your museum, but also to the broader community has been adequate? And what are your suggestions for um, improving this, this support? That's a, a good question. Um, you know, the communities that are connected to the Noguchi Museum have been incredibly supportive throughout the pandemic. Uh, and support comes in many shapes and forms. 
uh, individuals and granting organizations and institutions have continued to support the museum. Um, but we often struggle uh, for art and artists to be valued in society. And overall, we need more support, of course. Uh, financial support for arts communities needs to become more equitable moving forward too. Um, but it's also important to think about the support we've seen through visitor engagement in the last year. Um, audiences near and far have continued to make Noguchi's art exceptionally relevant, inspirational, and healing during this time. Um, and making art come alive is so important. Uh, so this kind of support really can't be undervalued. And my suggestion moving forward uh, is for visitors to engage more, uh, make art more important to your daily life. How would you describe, if you can take a step back, uh, the, the, the art scene in Long Island City and what prospects do you, you think for its, its future going forward? Yeah, uh, Long Island City has always been full of diverse cultures and it's just natural for the art scene to grow here. Um, I think the future is promising, especially as art institutions are improving how they can become more welcoming for space, uh, welcoming for communities, uh, creating broader access, uh, really making sure that our spaces are um, spaces that invite everybody in. And I say everybody, including marginalized communities, people of color, um, people who have not typically come to museums. Um, you know, Long Island City is a part of Queens, the most diverse county in the world. Um, you know, there's a, a, a lot of people to welcome and to support. And, you know, the Noguchi Museum uh, was founded by an artist who considered himself to be multicultural. Uh, he was a biracial artist who was born in 1904, and he wanted the museum to be a place for people to come and to reflect on their lives. Um, so we continue to do that. And I think other art institutions are also thinking a lot about that right now in Long Island City. Well, wonderful. Can you, can you give us the, again, the address and if somebody's interested in getting to the museum, what buses, what trains, how could one go to the Noguchi Museum uh, once, once it's, it's opened? I mean, what, what are the hours, the generally hours that it would, would be open in the future? Absolutely. Uh, so we are on 33rd Road and Vernon Boulevard, and we are closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, and we're open Wednesday through Sunday. And right now we have um, some limitations still. Um, as the world opens up, we will open up more and more too, uh, but we're open up by appointment only at the moment. And we have two time slots in which to vis visit uh, between 11 to two and three to six. Excellent. I, I can attest uh, from, from going there on several occasions that garden is in my opinion, one of the most uh, wonderful spots in the entire city of New York, and uh, you folks are doing a phenomenal job. Well, I wish the best of luck to you, uh, uh, Ms. Murphy, and to all the other staff members, and I hope that uh, everybody that is uh, following this uh, will have an opportunity to meet uh, uh, at the museum in the near future. So the best of luck to you, and uh, good luck. We'll, we'll, we'll talk after the crisis. Thanks so much, Bob. I hope so. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. We have an opportunity to speak with Audrey of uh, Audrey Di Mola of the Socrates Sculpture Park. So Audrey, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you guys are all about and some of the organizations you're affiliated with and about sort of the state of arts uh, as, as it exists now. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and thinking of Socrates. Socrates is so special. I feel like in Long Island City, I feel like it's part of this cultural and creative bedrock. It's 35 years old this year, which is incredible. And literally this oasis of green space carved out that is from literally the, the organic wonder and, and wanting of one artist, Mark de Suvero, who brought in the community and fellow artists to rehab a space that had fallen into disuse and disrepair it was a former marine terminal um, turned illegal dump site 
and this land is so special this land is so special and mark and all of these artists just really tapped into it and 35 years later it's a space for it is still the space that Mark and these artists intended it to be, which I think is so wonderful and beautiful as the whole neighborhood changes around it. It's still a place for large scale public art, for community, for people. It is a green space. It's a New York City park and it's a shapeshifter. It becomes lots of things for lots of different people. And so many different things can be experienced there just from you know, usual park kind of happenings, like coming in and walking your dog and hanging out with your kids to seeing amazing art that is produced on site most often. And also uh, programs, which is what I do there. Everything from yoga and meditation to hip hop, jazz, opera, healing, dancing, and everything in between. And we are also very happy for a long time to be a part of like a, a, the Long Island City Cultural Alliance. Can you with, give us a, a minute, a sentence or two about what that's all about, please? Yeah, just an organization that was started, you know, kind of back in the, in the days-ish um, when Long Island City needed to be promoted. I feel like now it's, it's on the map. I was, I was telling people that I'm, for, I'm born and raised in Long Island City and I would tell people where I was from and they would think I lived in Long Island. No one knew the acronym LIC. It was just like, where are you from? So um, I feel like the mission has has changed in that now it's instead of more like promoting tourism, I guess, to Long Island City, it's more about the interconnectivity of these arts organizations. What are the names of the organizations that belong to it? I don't know all of them, but some of them are PS1, uh, MoMA PS1, uh, Noguchi Museum, of course. Us, Museum of the Moving Image. So yeah. Well, that's a pretty good top of the lineup for uh, in any team. Yeah. So um, you have, like most, uh, virtually every organization uh, have, have been affected by the pandemic. Um, how's been your response uh, to, uh, to those challenges? Yeah, it's, it's been an experience of, of just grace. That, that, that's, that's what I will say. Our, our small but mighty staff has kept our park open. We never closed through this entire pandemic. Um, last year, we were the only arts org in New York City open by virtue of us being a park, by virtue of us being essential. And we um, somehow, literally, again, through grace and hard work from all of our little team on the finance side, on the fabrication side, on the grounds crew side, and just the heart of it, we were able to get our show up, Monuments Now, that was in the works for two years. And you know, on my end, we were not able to do the usual programming season that we would have, but we mm -hmm. found other ways, including you know, thanks to Hellgate Farm, we kept our farmer's market going. We did voter registration, thanks to Astoria Mutual Aid Network. We gave out seeds. We partnered with The Connected Chef and also with Ballet Folklorico to do some food distribution. So it was really beautiful and also just reconnected us to the roots of just this, the park as land, the park as park, the park as oasis, the park as safe space. And so it, it, didn't, it didn't matter almost that we weren't doing programming because people just needed a place to be, to feel safe. And it's more than arts, it's really neighborhood, it's community, and it really exemplifies, I think, a lot of the, the great spirit about sort of in one sense, a tough, gritty, and yet creative, um, aspects of, of the story of Long Island City community. But in terms of funding and stuff, do you think it's been adequate or what other suggestions do you have? Of course, we can, we never have everything that we, we need or want. What, what do you, what do you suggest if you could, uh, somebody could say, well, what, what additional support do you, do you need? Yeah, gosh, I mean, I always think the arts needs more, right? It's 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 the first thing that gets chopped off the list and it is it's it's the perpetual engine that drives everything. It's it's the soul of the world. It's the reason why we stay alive. It it's it's everything. And for it to just constantly be regarded as superficial, artificial, you know, just Dis dispensable, disposable is is tragic and and a travesty. So I can't speak to specifics of of finances and you know grants and things that we got because my wonderful colleagues in development and in finance were were handling that but just for you know we want to establish a precedent of always being able to pay artists 
because artists do things from their heart always and they're always doing things for free and they've fully you know this is i feel like this is a conception that is solidified early on you know and i see it in in my friends as well that you somehow think that your other skills are the tangible skills are the things that will make you money are the things that will help you survive but your artistic skills your empathic skills your creativity those are somehow the things that you can leave off your resume those are the things that don't really matter and i want to really change that paradigm and i feel like well said. money can help money can help change that you know for for the people that that pass through our park for us to have resources to always be giving them something and for them to be able to you know, in terms of the um, the actual sculptors and artists who are making physical work, for them to be able to dream even bigger and have more support um, to realize their their works. Well, you are that. you are an eloquent spokesperson for the for the arts uh, art scene of Long Island City in general, the artists, uh, it, you know, specifically. But how would you you sort of told us a little bit about the the, the art scene, uh, local art scene? What do you think its future prospects are in Long Island City, Astoria? Yeah. That's my last question to you. I mean, I'm I, I'm thinking about realities of, of a rapidly changing neighborhood. And it's not like Long Island City is the only place that this has ever happened to, right? It happens in cities. It happens throughout throughout history. Um, you know, but but I am I'm, I'm thinking of friends who have had studios in Long Island City for years and years who have, you know, in these recent years been priced out, been kicked out. You know, I think of theaters that have been able to hold on that ha that are now you know having to move so i'm i'm just thinking of yeah again how, how can we become more creative with the spaces that artists can find and create on their own because i think if it's one thing that we've seen in pandemic it's how the community rallies together in and of itself mm -hmm. you know with all of this rise of mutual aid work and just communities helping communities people helping people they make their own structures and they make their own supports and i think the, the more that we recognize that socrates is is a model that's what it's always been you know in in the original um exhibition pamphlets you know i've i've read them saying this is something that we made here but it's not like it cannot happen anywhere else so i th i think that that model like that that's the purpose of it to inspire people to transform space and reclaim space and i think as you know yeah the city is gentrifying the neighborhood is changing rapidly we need to be able to carve out whatever we can and then and then to kind of see how we can partner to make those spaces bigger um and not and not just settle for the crumbs because we're good at that the artists are good at working with nothing and <laughs> as as ingenious and beautiful as that is the support the support needs to, to be there and the space needs needs to be there. We all need artists. We all need ideas. And I think as time goes on, that becomes greater and greater in people's awareness and consciousness. And you, Audrey, are a, a eloquent speaker you know, to, to argue the case of, of the arts and the importance of arts. I do thank you for your time. Um, and uh, I, I do suggest that uh, if uh, anybody has uh, an opportunity over the summer to come out to the, uh, the park. And uh, in my, my opinion, uh, the Socrates Sculpture Park is one of the most outstanding locations in all of New York City. You, know, you have Rockefeller Center and you have the Battery and, you know, of course, the Brooklyn Promenade. Oh, those are wonderful places. Lincoln Center, of course. But there's something that's very unique and special. And uh, I want to thank you, Audrey, and, and, and the people that make the magic happen at Socrates. Thank you. Have a good day, and uh, I will be talking to you, I hope, in a very near future. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay.